Well, I'm going to ask you if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. We're going to begin uh, in chapter number 10 of the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter number 10. This message today is being recorded uh, and it will be on our YouTube page later as well. So if you want to go back and collect some of the information, maybe if you weren't able to take notes today, you can collect the information and then uh, go back and review some of the stuff that I'm going to be sharing with you today. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 10. We're going to begin at verse number 1. Jeremiah was a major prophet of the Old Testament. Now remember church, a major prophet and a minor prophet were not considered major and minor prophets because the major prophet was more important. That's not why they called them major and minor prophets. It had to do with the length of the content of their work. So Jeremiah's work was several chapters long. His content was much lengthier than say Micah, for example. So even though they're both prophets of God, Jeremiah has more content, therefore he's considered a major prophet. And Micah has uh, less content, he's considered a minor prophet. Has nothing to do with their status, has nothing to do with one being a better prophet or a holier prophet, has nothing to do with that. It just has to do with how long their content and their writing is. Jeremiah is a major prophet, and we're going to see what he has to say down here in chapter 10, beginning at verse number 1, and ask yourself this question, does this sound like a Christmas tree when I read this to you? All right, because today we're going to be talking about Christians and Christmas. Jeremiah chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. Hear what the word of the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Now, time out. Who is God's talking to here? Who's Jeremiah? Who? God is speaking through Jeremiah to who, church? Israel. Israel. He said, Hear the word the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the nations. Uh, learn not the way of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations are dismayed at them. For the customs of the peoples are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an axe by the hands of a craftsman. They decorate this tree with silver and with gold, and they fasten it with hammer and nails so that it cannot move. However, their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field. They cannot speak. They have to be carried. They cannot walk. Therefore, do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither is it in them to do good. I want to back up just a little bit. And I want to begin in verse 3. And I want to read this part again. It says, For the customs of the peoples are vanity, talking about the surrounding heathen nations. He says, a tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an axe by the hands of a craftsman. They then decorate this tree with silver and gold and they fasten it with a hammer and nail so that it cannot move. And in verse 5, it tells us exactly what this tree is. Their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field. <laughs> Let us pray together this morning. Father, thank you one more time for being able to come to your house to share your word. Lord, this is an unusual message that I'm bringing today, but it's an important message. It's an important message because your people need to be informed. Your word tells us that your people perish for a lack of knowledge. So Lord, I pray today that this information will develop in us a knowledge and that knowledge will then be put into practice and we can utilize wisdom. I pray today, God, that we will have a clear understanding uh, when we leave here today and God, we're going to give you the glory, the praise, and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. My brothers and sisters, this time of year is very special for several reasons. One of the things that I like about this time of year is getting together with family, having good meals, and I enjoy the whole Christmas spirit and things like that. Now, because of my profession as a minister, because of that, I'm often bombarded with questions and sometimes I'm even attacked on my views and every now and then I have to find myself defending the Christian faith when it comes to Christianity and this idea of Christmas. 
And usually what happens is, church, is the accusation goes something like this. They'll say, you Christians are worshiping pagan gods, whether you know it or not, because you are celebrating Christmas on December 25th. It's a pagan holiday known as Sol Invictus. And because of that, you, your tree, your gifts, your tree topper, your decorations, and your whole Christmas spirit is of the devil. That's kind of usually what I get. <laughs> they usually let Brother Hunter have it with both barrels. And I just want to say this before we go any farther. Just because someone does not necessarily agree with my view or your view on Christmas does not make them our enemy. Amen? You know, we still love them. And just because they don't agree with us doesn't mean that we don't like them. It doesn't mean they're bad people. It doesn't mean that, you know, hey, we're right and they're always wrong. It's none of those things. I believe what it simply is, it's been a misplacement of information, and I'm going to share that with you here in just a moment. Now, I want you to understand today that a lot of people are convinced that we as born-again New Testament Christians are somehow either knowingly or unknowingly uh, worshiping a, a pagan holiday and doing pagan rituals. Why? Because we celebrate Christmas on December 25th. And so what I want to do in this study today, and that's what this is going to be, this is going to be more of a teaching time. I don't plan on getting wild and hollering and running around and doing all that. Notice I said I don't plan on it. But I'm going to try my best to do more of a teaching format today. So here's what I want to cover in this message. Number one, I want to talk about the December 25th date and the early church. Because whether you know this or not, Christians in the early church long before December 25th was ever uh, appointed as a pagan holiday, and yes, it was appointed as a pagan holiday, long before that, Christians were discussing December 25th. I'm going to show you how that the Christian church was divided in two groups. One group believed that Christmas or the birth of Christ would have been December 25th. Another group believed it would have been January the 6th. I'm going to explain why they think that. Then we're not only going to talk about the date of December 25th, but I'm going to then talk a little bit about various calendars that make uh, pinpointing the exact, exact day of Jesus' birth difficult. Because church, whether you realize it or not, right about the time of the birth of Jesus, there was like five calendars that were being interchanged and being used. That made it a little bit difficult. Then we're going to talk about the pagan festival of December 25th. You know, the pagans, they have a festival and they have a celebration on December 25th as well. And then the last thing we're going to talk about is how does God view what we call intent? Intent, what is your intention? Now, before we go any further, I just want to take, I just want to take a quick poll of the congregation that's here. How many of you would say, Pastor... If a person who claims to be a believer of God goes to a temple where idols are worshipped and that person gets on their knees in a worshipping position, how many of you would honestly say, Brother Hunter, I would have to count that as idol worship and so would God because this person says they're a Christian but they're going over here to this other temple and they're bowing down in the worshiping position. How many of you would agree and say, Brother Hunter, that sounds like that somebody's worshiping another God. How many of you all would agree with that? Okay, that's fair enough. How many of you don't even want to answer? You're like, I don't want to answer at all. There's a reason why I'm asking that question. We're going to come back to it at the end and it has to do with what we call intent. So the first thing let's do is let's start in on the December 25th date. December 25th in the early church. So there are a couple of traditions and customs concerning the early church and the date of December 25th that a lot of people are not familiar with. And the only way that we can find out what those are, we have to take off our modern 21st century glasses and we have to put on our ancient Near East glasses and we have to read the Bible from their perspective and from their context. How many of you know that in Jewish tradition and customs that the Jewish people believed that their prophets died on the same day they were born? How many of you knew that? It's not that they believed if they were born on June the 5th, they would die on June the 5th. They didn't necessarily believe it was the same month. They just believed it was the same day. They felt like if a prophet was born on the third of a month, then that prophet would also die on the third of a month. Maybe not the same month, but the same day. 
Now, I'm not saying that this is accurate. I'm saying that Jewish people in the early church, during the time of the early church, they believed this. They had this belief. You say, well, why would you even share that with us? Because this ties into the December 25th date, okay? This ties into it. So traditions and customs concerning prophets. The way that they calculated this December 25th day had something to do with this belief in prophets dying on the day that they were born. So are you ready for this church? Check this out. Say, teach, Pastor Hunter, I'm going to. In the early church, our early church was divided by two groups. Not the Baptists and the Catholics. <laughs> they were divided into two groups. The Eastern Church and the Western Church. Okay? Now, we're all the church. Amen? We're all the church. We're all the body of Christ. But there are Eastern traditions and then there are Western traditions. And not just when it comes to the birth of Jesus, when it comes to a lot of different things. The Eastern Christians sometimes look at things a little bit different than the Western Christians do. So here's what I want to share with you. Early Christians, 200 years removed from Jesus Christ, 100 years removed from Jesus Christ, 150 years removed, for Je removed from Jesus Christ, early Christians in the Eastern Church and the Western Church got together. Here it comes. Not because they were trying to figure out when Jesus was born. That is a fallacy. If you hear people say that the early church was trying to calculate the birthday of Jesus, that is incorrect. They were not concerned with the birthday of Jesus. You know what they were trying to find out, church? They were trying to find out when did Jesus die. Why did the early church want to find that day out? Because they wanted to celebrate his resurrection. They knew if they could calculate when his death was, they would also be able to calculate the resurrection. And as a result, we could celebrate the resurrection. Makes sense, doesn't it? However, because the fact that there was one view by the Eastern Church and one view by the Western Church, and because there were five different calendars being intertwined during this time, they were having a difficult time pinpointing when Jesus actually died. So therefore, you had two schools of thought amongst early Christians. All right, th now I'm talking about this is before December 25th was ever appointed as a pagan holiday. This is before. That happened in the year 267 BC, uh, AD. I'll get back to that in a minute. Prior to this December 25th being appointed as a pagan holiday, Christian believers in the Eastern and Western churches were not disputing, but they were discussing when they thought Jesus died so that they could celebrate the resurrection. And one group in the Western, the Western Christians, they calculated, right? They did some calculating and they came up with Jesus having died on like March 25th. So they just calculated and figured they thought he'd have been born December 25th. Now, the Eastern Church, on the other hand, they believed that Jesus died in April and that the birthday of Jesus would have been January the 6th. See, this is, these are the things they don't tell you. You know, when people say, you Christians are celebrating a pagan holiday, they don't tell you that part. They don't tell you the part that half of the church believed that Jesus was born on December 25th, while the other half believed that he was born on January the 6th. Did you know that Christians in the eastern part of the world still celebrate Christmas on January 6th? Some of them do. Right, because they just simply, they didn't know. They were trying to calculate. They were trying to calculate when Jesus died so they could celebrate the resurrection. But because they could not pinpoint the day, are you ready for this? They said, well, why don't we as the church do this? Why don't we just worship on the day that he was resurrected, which was Sunday and that's how we got to come into church on Sunday. Are you with me, folks? So the reason that we go to church on Sunday is not because God changed the Sabbath day. That is not what happened. The reason that New Testament believers go to church on Sunday is because when the early church was trying to calculate the death and resurrection of Christ, they were having a difficult time doing so. And as a result, they decided, we know he rose on the first day of the week, so on the first day of the week, we're just going to celebrate that day as the Resurrection Sunday. And that's why every Sunday we get together and have church. It's because the early Christians that lived way back about 100 years after Jesus, 150 years after Jesus, 200 years after Jesus, they were trying to figure all of this out. 
When was Jesus, uh, when did he die? And when was he crucified? When did he rise again? And figuring out his birthday was a byproduct of that. The early church never set out to, they didn't care about Jesus' birthday. I know that's hard <laughs> for us to hear, right? But the early church didn't care. They cared about the death and the resurrection. That's what they wanted to celebrate. They didn't care about the birthday. But as it turns out, the Eastern Church and the Western Church disagreeing on when they thought Jesus was born, the Western Church sort of, I don't you want to use the, the term one, but their view became the most dominant view. And therefore, people believed in the early church that Jesus' birthday was December the 25th. Now, they again, they came up with this date because they were trying to calculate they were trying to calculate his death and his resurrection. They weren't trying to calculate his birth. That was just, and my other point is, they were doing all of this calculating before December 25th was appointed as a pagan holiday. Now, here's a, here's a good question. Are there any, is there any documentation out there that we have that would suggest that early Christians were talking about this before pagans made December 20 or before they was appointed their, their pagan holiday. Were early Christians discussing December 25th prior to the pagans discussing December 25th? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Hippolaus was a, a writer and he was doing, he was writing a commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. Now Hippolaus was one of the followers of the disciples. So Jesus had his 12 disciples. They all had followers. John, who was exiled on the Isle of Patmos, he had a follower named Polycarp, and Polycarp had a student, and they all, there were students, and Hippolaus is in that line. He's one of the early believers, right? Hippolaus was one of the early believers, and in his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, he mentions December 25th, and he mentions January the 6th as possible birthdays for Jesus Christ. Now, he mentions this 150 years before December 25th was appointed as a pagan holiday. I'm going to prove that to you here in a minute. Now, what other uh, material do we have? Well, predating Hippolaus, we have another person named Clement of Alexander. And this person wrote about the comparison between the January 6th date and the December 25th date. In other words, Clement of Alexandria predates Hippolaus and the pagan appointment of December 25th. And in his writings, he's discussing how the early church was kind of disputing over when was Jesus born. And they were disputing over that because they were trying to calculate his death and his resurrection. So there are documents prior to December 25th being appointed as a pagan holiday. Now let's talk about the second part here. Let's talk about the various calendars used during this time. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's about five different calendars that were being used right around the time of the birth of Christ. The Julian calendar had been used for a, a good while prior to that. The Romans had their own calendars. Then there was a Hebrew calendar, right? Then we had uh, what was known, what we still have today, the Gregorian calendar, you know. So there's a lot of different calendars being used. But there's one calendar that very few people know anything about. Very few people know about this calendar, and this calendar is called the Qumran calendar. Now, what makes the Qumran calendar special? The Qumran calendar is unique because the religious Jewish people that lived during the time of Christ were called the Essenes, the Essenes, the, the Essene Jews. And it's believed that the Essenes were the ones that put the Dead Sea Scrolls together and hid them in the Qumran caves that they might be preserved. Well, guess what else they found in those Qumran caves with all of those biblical documentations? They found a calendar. Now, church, how many of you all know that every calendar just about that we know of in order to make everything work out right, you either got to add a day here or you got to take something out there. Like on our Gregorian calendar, every four years, we got to have a leap year put in there, right? Because if we don't, it'll, it'll kind of get out of whack. The Hebrew calendar, the Hebrew calendar that they were using at the time was so far off track that ever so many years, they had to add an extra month in there ever so many years to kind of keep things lined up. But here's what's very interesting. 
The Qumran calendar has 364 days in it. The Qumran calendar does not have to be modified in any shape, form, or fashion. Every Sabbath lines up the way it's supposed to. Every feast day lines up the way it's supposed to. And when the early church, when they, when they were looking at all this, a lot of them, some of them were using this Qumran calendar saying, wait a minute, guys, Jesus here, he wasn't born in December, nor was he born in January. Uh, the way they do this is they look at when Passover fell during the time of Christ. Now, are you ready for this? Check it out. According to the Qumran calendar, Jesus wasn't born in December or in January. According to the Qumran calendar, Jesus was born in September. September the 11th, just to be quite frank with you. So the Qumran calendar seems to be the most accurate calendar with regard to religious days and feasts and celebrations and holidays and things like that. The Qumran calendar that was placed there by the Essene Jews and used by the Essene Jews, they would tell people this is the calendar of God because nothing has to be changed. So the Qumran calendar actually tells a little bit different story. But what does this have to do with December 25th in the paganism? Pastor, you, I don't want to get off track, but, but you got to tell me about, about this December 25th date and the pagans. Here we go. The pagan appointment of December 25th. How many of you have ever heard of uh, the winter solstice called Sol Invictus? Anybody familiar with Sol Invictus? Maybe you've heard other people talk about it. So pagan people who were non-believers, they didn't believe in God, they were pagans, they were, you know, people from other nations. They had a lot of celebrations that they did that we would not celebrate today. But one of the things that the pagans would celebrate was a time called uh, Sol Invictus. Now what does that mean? Sol Invictus simply means the birth of the unconquerable sun, S-U-N. And this was celebrated by the pagans. But the pagans did not have a specific date that they celebrated on until a Roman emperor, a Roman emperor named Aurelian came along. And this Roman emperor who disliked Christians knew that the Christians thought December 25th might be the day that Jesus was born. So this Roman emperor appointed December 25th as Sol Invictus on behalf of the pagans to jab at the Christians. But what this Roman emperor didn't know is the Christians didn't care about the birth of Jesus. They were trying to calculate his death and burial and resurrection. But he gave them December 25th as their holiday and he gave them this holiday um, in the year 274 A.D. So when people tell you you're worshiping a pagan holiday when you uh, have Christmas on December 25th, pagans never worshiped or did any kind of festival or so. They didn't do the Sol Invictus on December 25th until the year 257 A.D. We have writings that predate that 257 A.D. that says the Christians done knew about the December 25th. They already was calculating. They just didn't celebrate it. They were just trying to calculate. Not because they wanted to know the birth of Jesus. That was a byproduct. They wanted to know the death and the resurrection of Christ. That's what they wanted to celebrate. But this Roman emperor, not liking Christians, wanting to stick it to Christians, appointed December 25th as Sol Invictus, the celebration of the birth of the unconquerable son. Now, for a little while, this went over for a while. There were Christians in the early church that knew better. There were some people outside the church that didn't know and quite frankly didn't care. Until a little while later, two scholars came along. Two scholars came along, and you can look this information up. One scholar was... Um, Jablonski. He was a German Protestant scholar. The other one was Jean Dom Hefdre. He was a French Catholic scholar. Now, why are these two people important? Why are these two gentlemen important in this discussion and in history? Because these were the two scholars who first started teaching that Christians stole December 25th from the pagans. 
And when they started teaching this, a lot of people believed them. And from then all the way up until now, I still get people telling me that we celebrate Christmas and that we're stealing a pagan holiday. That is not true. The Christians were already calculating and looking at the dates prior to December 25th being a pagan holiday. Again, the Christians didn't care about the birthday. They were looking for his, the day of his death. But the reason they would calculate the 25th or the 6th had to do with that tradition of a prophet dying on the same day they were born. So understand, let me say again, the pagans did not have December 25th appointed to them until the year 257 A.D. Or, I'm sorry, 2, I wrote it down here, 274 A.D. And these two scholars came along and taught that Christians stole December 25th from the pagans. And for the majority of history, people have believed that. But that is not the case. How do we know it's not true, Brother Hunter? Because we've got two documents that predate 257 A.D. We got two documents that predate it that shows the Christians were already looking into this. They were already thinking that December 25th might be a possible birthday. And it was only the Christians in the West that thought this. The Christians in the East, they still celebrate January the 6th. So what am I trying to say this morning? Well, I'm trying to say a lot of things, but one of the things I'm trying to say is Christians did not steal December 25th from the pagans and turn it into a Christian holiday. That's not what happened. The Christians, some of them, thought Jesus could have been born on December 25th. So a Roman emperor appointed that day as a pagan holiday, and the pagans started celebrating ever since. And now, because of these two scholars and their work, some of the things that they wrote, of course, they didn't say anything about uh, the, the two documents that predate this appointment of December 25th. But these two scholars convinced a lot of people in the academic world that Christians stole December 25th from pagans. It just simply is not true and it's not accurate. And we can prove it because we have documents that predate that uh, appointment. Okay, so let's go on. Now, we think about, um, when we think about December 25th, the day, and why they were looking at it, and we talk about these, uh, this Roman emperor and the pagans and Sol Invictus and all of those things and how they celebrate that on December 25th. The question is, how does God look at all this? Now, we go back to our original text verse of Jeremiah chapter 10, and many people will point out there, they'll say, look at there, there's a Christmas tree right there in Jeremiah 10. Here, they're bringing in a tree, they're decorating it, and that's a Christmas tree. And, but friends, could I just say this? That's impossible to be talking about a Christmas tree. It's impossible. There is no way Jeremiah could be referring to that. It is impossible for him to be referring to that. You know how I know? Because Jesus had not yet been born in the flesh yet. There was no Christmas at that time. What's Jeremiah referring here to here? Jeremiah is referring to idol worship. He says they go into the woods, they get a tree, they bring it in, they carve it up, they, they make a face out of it, then they put gold and jewelry and all these different decorations on this idol and they worship that idol. Now, I know later on in the Middle Ages, people will say, well, you know, Kris Kringle came along and all the pagans kept adding to and adding to and adding to. And some of the stuff that Christians do today is very similar to what the pagans did. Brother Hunter, don't you think God would be upset about that? Everything in life is about intent, the intent of the heart. And I'm going to prove this to you here scripturally. The question is, does God look at Christians that celebrate the birth of Jesus on December 25th and say, well, because the pagans also celebrate that day, you guys are doing wrong. Remember that question I asked you at the beginning of this whole entire discussion? The question was, if a person who is a believer goes into the temple of another God and gets down in the worshiping position, how would God view that? Would God view that as this man turning on him and worshiping another God? And most of us that had the courage to raise our hand <laughs> said, yes, that sure is what it seems like, Brother Hunter. I want to show you what intent really means because I don't know if you're aware of this, but over in the Old Testament, in the book of 2 Kings, there is a gentleman by the name of Naaman. 
And Naaman is a Syrian. He's the leader of the Syrian army. He is not a believer in Yahweh God. He had never attended any of, uh, any of, the, any of the temple. He'd never worshiped in the temple, the tabernacle. He never paid a tithe or an alm. He never went and heard the Torah. He never even read the Torah. He never went to church. The priests never blessed him. None of those things. But yet somehow or another, this guy, when he got leprosy, heard about the prophet of God. He goes to see the prophet of God. And the prophet says, dip yourself seven times in the river Jordan and you'll be clean. And Naaman got angry at first and said, aren't there a lot of cleaner rivers around here? And his servant that was with him said, oh, but Naaman, if, if this man can heal you, just, just, what have you got to lose? Just try it. Do what he says. Go in there and, and, and go to the river Jordan and see. So he dipped himself seven times, and on the seventh time he was healed and he was clean. This is where it gets interesting. Naaman goes back to the prophet of God and says, I've got two things I want to talk to you about. Number one, can I take some dirt with me? Can you take some dirt with you? Of all the things you could ask this prophet, you're asking the prophet, can I take dirt with me? That's what Naaman asked. He said, can I take some dirt with me? Now, the reason for that is got to do with ancient customs. Remember, we got to look at things with our ancient lenses. He believed that if he took dirt from Israel back with him, that he perhaps would put it in his home. He felt like that was God's territory. But something else that's really fascinating that I wanted to share with you in 1 Kings chapter 5, verses 17, 18, and 19, Naaman has a very strange request. Naaman goes to Elisha and says, Look, I now believe and I now know that there's only one true God, and his name is Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I believe in him, and I will not worship any other God other than Yahweh God. He says, But I got a problem. He tells the prophet, He says, I got a problem. The prophet says, what's your problem? He said, the problem is, as the leader of the army, one of my positions and one of my duties is our king is very old. And I have to take my king over to the temple of the God that we worship. And I have to get down on my knees with the king while he worships and prays. He goes, now, I'm not worshiping that God. He goes, I want, I want Yahweh to know that I worship him. And he asked the prophet, he said, what do I do? Do I just risk my life and not take the king? What do I do? And it was the response of the prophet that is amazing. He says, God knows the intent of your heart. He knows that you're not going to worship another God. So go in peace and do your job. When you and I put up a Christmas tree at our house and we celebrate Christmas, God knows that you and I as Christian believers are not worshiping Sol Invictus. We're not bowing down to the tree. We're not asking the spirit of Christmas or Santa Claus or anybody else to give us any kind of special favor. We're just simply celebrating the birth of our Lord Jesus. Now, do I think Jesus was born on, Sept uh, on uh, uh, December 25th? I don't. I don't think he was. I think the evidence shows he was born in September. But does God get angry at believers for celebrating Christmas? The answer, I believe, is no. I don't think that for one second. There's no way you're going to convince me that you got a Christian believer that loves God, helps people, gives to the poor, does the will of God, prays, reads their Bible, but suddenly all of that means nothing because they had a Christmas celebration at their house. It just it doesn't square up. It doesn't line up. Now, let me just say this in closing. If you have friends, family, relatives, people that you know, and they don't celebrate Christmas, maybe it's for some of the reasons I mentioned. Maybe they got their own reasons. I want to remind you that they're not your enemy. They're not our enemy. You know, we love all people. You know, if, if it, 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 just because somebody else doesn't believe in it, that's okay. There's no reason to be mad at somebody or, or, or to have any kind of friction or any kind of negative discourse. We love people. Even if we don't see eye to eye on everything, we still love them. But just remember, there were Christian believers who were trying to calculate when Jesus died. And as a byproduct, they were also calculating when he was born. Two groups of Christians, the East and the West. In the East, they think January 6th. In the West, they believe December 25th. 
The December 25th pagan institution was not done until 257 AD. And there are writings that predate that where the Christians are actually discussing the possible birth dates of Jesus. So let me say this, the Christians did not steal a pagan holiday. The pagans were appointed a day that some Christians thought Christ would have been born on. And that's really what's going on with December 25th and Christmas. Now, I don't have any idea who that word was for or why God put that on me. I was actually just going to do a YouTube video on it, but for some reason I just felt it uh, necessary to speak about this today. So I do not believe there's anything wrong with your family celebrating Christmas. And at, at the same time, I don't think we should be mad at somebody because they don't necessarily agree with us. We all get along with all people. And so anyway, uh, that is Christians and Christmas. That's the way it is. The pagans picked that up later on. And for some reason throughout history, people have thought that Christians stole it from pagans, but we didn't. We were figuring all this stuff up before that was ever uh, made a holiday by the Roman emperor. So. For whatever reason, there's the information. Take it, do what you want to with it. I'm going to ask you this morning to bow your heads for prayer. I want to address our online audience first. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to address our online audience first. Maybe there's some of you watching online that would say, Pastor, that was somewhat interesting, some information I didn't hear before, but you know, I got a lot of things going on in my life right now. I need prayer. Friends, we want to pray for you. We want you to know that we love you. And that whether you celebrate Christmas or whether you don't really means nothing if you have no real personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And the only way that you can have a real relevant relationship with Christ is to come to this place that when God draws you to Him, you're willing to turn from your sins and follow Jesus and be obedient to Him. And friend, if that's you, we love you. We're praying for you and we're asking that God will draw you to Him. Maybe you're watching us today and you say, Pastor, I've got some problems in my life I'm dealing with. I need prayer. I need help. I need hope. Friend, we're praying for you. We love you. I'm believing that God's going to help you. For those of you that are here in person, I don't know why God put this on my heart to share with you. Maybe it was just for informative reasons, but I want you to know that whatever you got going on in your life, we're still going to pray for you. We still love you. If you're dealing with some things and you know, you've got problems, but you don't have the solution. Let us pray with you today. If you're going through some personal things, let us pray with you. Whatever your need is, we want to ask you to come today so you can, you can come and talk to God about these things. Heavenly Father, I pray for each and every person that's here under the sound of my voice. I pray and I ask God today that you will speak to them. I pray, Lord, if there's anybody here that needs Christ, they will come and receive Christ today. Lord, if there's anybody that is hurting God, let them come and get relief today. Father, if there's those that are looking for a church home, let them find that today. Lord, whatever the need is, I pray needs will be met, lives will be changed, and hearts will be touched. For it's in Jesus' name we ask, amen.